small office practice. Um, I do a fair amount of long-term care work, which has been my first exposure to uh, frailty. Um, but uh, for the past 25, 30 years, I've been doing house calls um, in the K1G and K1T area, which for people who uh, work in those areas appreciate that it's underserviced uh, for uh, home visits. Um, I started doing this so early that back in the days, we actually had our own uh, symptom management kit that we developed at Greenboro uh, so that we made sure we had uh, medications available for uh, quick changes um, over uh, long weekends. So when it comes to frailty, um, I think this is what a lot of people sort of uh, think about. They, you know, there's a lot of black holes, a lot of dark spots. You know, but what I like about this picture, which um, I took um, uh, when I was a little bit younger, is that uh, when you look at this thing, we, we uh, in the Western world have always thought of uh, constellations as the bright lights. Um, but in Bolivia, where this picture was taken, you know, the constellations by the uh, people who live there were actually uh, formed by the dark spaces between the dark stars. And so I'm hoping that uh, this really mimics what, uh, what we do know about frailty and will sort of integrate so that people get a better picture of what's uh, there. Uh, before I start, um, I'd like to have just a brief idea as to what your background is. So this is a poll. Um, and if I can ask you to um, sort of answer it so that uh, there is an idea, um, so I know who I'm speaking with. Now I'm just realizing that uh, the poll showed up on my screen, but uh, I can't click it. Um, so when, um, <clears throat> when uh, Carl or Nadine, um, when when the, most people have answered, even just sort of show the results. Okay, yeah, sounds good. I'll just uh, open it up here for uh, another 20, 30 seconds or so. And, and, for those, yeah, and, and for those who haven't answered, if we can just sort of kick them off um, because obviously they're not gonna engage. No, I'm just kidding. Carl, I just wanted to mention that there are some comments in the chat that that some people can't click submit or it they might, can't. Uh, it might just be what device you're on for for a few people. So uh, maybe if if it's not letting you click submit, just write in the chat for us um, what uh, your background is in healthcare, and then also kind of your your knowledge of frailty, just in the chat, so we can know. Oh, there's a lot of chats there. Yeah, and for those of you who are wondering, um, yes, I am standing. I've been sitting most of the day, um, but uh, so I need to stretch out my legs. Okay, so we have a lot of nurses and uh, physicians slash nurse practitioners um, and uh, allied health personal. Oh, this is great. It's a very nice um, uh, sort of sample of uh, different uh, approach, different uh, uh, sort of things that people do when approaching frailty. So uh, uh, next uh, poll question, um, your knowledge of frailty uh, right now um, would be best described by which comment? Uh, number one is how do you spell it? Number two, I've heard of it. Number three, I've seen it. And the last one, which is what I'm hoping is I move over, I can give the talk. And it looks like uh, just going by, just to read out the poll questions again for the people in the recording, it looks like 35% uh, of people joining us are nurses and 19% are doctors or nurse practitioners, 7% are allied health and 8% are social workers, 8% personal support workers, 4% spiritual care, 14% volunteers, 4% uh, caregivers. And uh, so that's awesome. Thanks everyone for answering that. And for the second question that's coming in here around your knowledge of frailty is best described by, uh, we have one person who answered, uh, how do you spell it? <laughs> so thank you for answering that. And uh, uh, for I have heard of it, we have 31% of people. Okay. I have seen it, we have 62%. 
And 5% of people are really experts on this. They say, move over, I can give the talk. Oh, no, I'm going <laughs> for my money. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so this is uh, just a basic uh, approach. Um, so I have to do my uh, uh, disclosing uh, comments. Um, and I'll just uh, be talking about a bunch of definitions, uh, some predictive models, and, and just general approaches, uh, looking at system issues, goal preference, and goals of care uh, issues. Uh, the nice thing um, for frailty, if you enjoy frailty, is that it's not a clear line from A to B. Um, and if you don't enjoy um, sort of nebulous, gray zones, what ifs, um, then uh, of course it's, uh, uh, that's where the F word comes in. Um, so who am I? Um, I have, uh, I, I do speak with the old man, I'm a secret girl. I facilitate the palliative care courses and I've uh, facilitated ideas courses. Ideas are quality improvement things. Uh, potential for conflicts of interest. Um, basically, uh, nothing's applicable. Um, if there is a slight conflict of interest, um, I will bring it up right at the time anyways, um, in particularly in the context of answering questions, but also um, in elaborating on some of the slides. So what I'd like people to uh, come out of is to consider moderate to severe frailty as a life-limiting condition. Um, and uh, from that uh, would be to start the palliative care approach or at least to consider it and given the time of day um, to stay awake. So when you look at uh, palliative care, um, you're gonna have to... when you look at the palliative care, the, the definition um, from the World Health Organization um, is uh, it's an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families associated with life-threatening illness. And I would um, argue that um, we, we consider um, frailty as a life-limiting illness, a life-limiting condition. And so as a result, if that's the case, then they would fall um, under the auspices of benefiting from a palliative care approach. And because of that, um, when you read the fine print, we'll be able to prevent and relieve suffering um, through uh, the, the treatment of issues and, you know, physical, psychosocial, social, and spiritual issues. So everybody has seen this, where they, these are sort of dying curves, if you will, um, where people uh, have a high function and a lower level of functioning. And lower level specifically means um, uh, much more disabled. <clears throat> and so people with cancer tend to do well. Um, and should the treatment start to fail, there's a rapid progression to death. When you have um, chronic diseases, <clears throat> you'll do well, you'll putter, you'll have an exacerbation, um, and then you'll come back, you'll recover, but usually at a lower level than what you started at. The thing about frailty and dementia as well is that the trajectory is quite unpredictable and much flatter um, than the other two trajectories um, mentioned. So if you look at our um, Ontario uh, health standards, they talk about a timely access to palliative care support. And so in my opinion, um, failing to recognize frailty denies people of this quality statement. Um, and then from there, if you don't have timely access or if people are not recognized, then you don't get the goals of care, you don't get any of the other things to go along with, that, that go along with appreciating that's what you require. Um, and then, of course, um, education for healthcare providers and volunteers. Um, and uh, basically, that's what I'm doing here. And that's what I hope others uh, will start doing as well. So frailty, I mean, I've been talking about it. Um, some people don't know how to spell it. Um, and, uh, but basically, there are quite a few different ways of defining things. But in theory, it's a, an, a state of increased vulnerability that uh, results from age-associated decline in the reserve and function across a whole slew of different system, uh, systems. So your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, and so on. Um, such that your ability to cope with um, stressors is compromised, okay? And so basically, it's uh, most often uh, looked at as an age-related syndrome, okay? But is it really, right? Because here you have two people um, of similar age, and one is frail, and the other one would not be considered frail. 
And so how do we uh, talk about it? Well, there are various models that have been uh, described. And the first one quite some time ago was through uh, Freed. And basically he was talking about a cycle of frailty um, where your, de your metabolic rate decreased, uh, which meant that you didn't need to eat as much, but because you didn't eat as much, you lost muscle mass. And so then you lost some power, you didn't walk, and everything started uh, sort of getting into a worse and worse situations such that you ended up eventually being dependent. And so the big, uh, the big three were, the big five were weakness, slowness, exhaustion, low physical activity, and unintentional weight loss. And for those who just had a few features, um, they would be described as pre-frail. And so this is where a lot of people have difficulties because there's, there's nothing there um, to actually give you, you know, what defines as weakness, what is defined as slowness. It's not like uh, you have a heart attack and you can actually have a test that gives you the answer or tests that sort of give you the answers. So it's more of a syndrome um, because it measures features of things as opposed to actual uh, components. So how do we measure it? Oh, there's a whole bunch of ways, right? So uh, there's some questionnaires where if you score high, uh, you're declared frail. Um, there's uh, functional things, so the walking speed, the time to get up and go uh, and back. Um, Self-reported, which uh, is variable depending on how people think uh, things are. Uh, you can get a, an assessment. Uh, some people just use the number of medications you're on. So if you're on five meds or more, automatically you're frail. Um, and then there's uh, 15 items, so big questionnaires. Um, so when we look at the uh, time to, to get up and go, um, it, it's important because uh, what we have found um, is that grip and gait is a better predictive uh, model for all-cause mortality than your actual blood pressure. Um, and so there's a variety of ways of measuring this, but uh, this information was uh, published in The Lancet. Um, and here in Ontario, in Southwestern Ontario, with Dr. Linda Lee, uh, there's a quick measuring uh, test, which has an 87% positive predictive value. So if you do this um, and you determine somebody is frail, you're going to be right 90% of the time. And basically, it just measures your gait, uh, your, your grip strength, and uh, a walk test, both of which can be done in the office in a, a standard 15-minute uh, visit. Now, I like pictures, right? So I use the clinical frailty scale. It was developed again by a Canadian uh, out of Dalhousie. Um, and basically he looked at uh, a variety of prognostic features and uh, was innovative, was able to put them in the context of uh, images that people could understand. So when you look at frailty, um, and if you're frailty level seven, this is what a lot of people seem to think about uh, frailty. Um, and so, you know, even though they might be stable, uh, they're at very high risk of dying within the next six months. And I'm thinking about how about the people who are moderately frail? And because these are the ones that, do, that uh, may not require acute, active, end of life uh, palliative care, but do require a palliative care approach um, to care uh, to minimize some of the side effects of usual treatments. Again, looking at pictures, um, if you uh, think of somebody who is not frail, um, they are represented by the green line. So when they have a, an acute stressor, as an example, um, like a, say a, a kidney infection, um, they get treated and they come back exactly at the same level. If they're partially compromised, um, so somebody who would be 65, 70 years old, normal aging, um, with that same kidney infection, they'll recover nicely um, with a slight drop in function. Usually we call it a bit of deconditioning. Um, that's usually related to being in bed in the hospital setting for, uh, until the IV medications are no longer needed. But if you're frail and you have that same stress, you end up with a large drop in function. And that's what's meant by uh, a reduced or impaired uh, resiliency. One of the ways to, uh, to think of uh, frailty is uh, to, to consider a canoe. Um, so if you're not frail, uh, like this canoe would demonstrate, um, basically you're floating high, you glide well, um, and even if you have big waves and big headwinds, uh, things uh, are well tackled. 
But if you think of frailty as an overloaded canoe, or perhaps with just one inch of freeboard, just a small amount. Um, and so what happens is that when you do things in that canoe, say you're just shifting weight, um, all of a sudden that weight shifting puts the whole uh, canoe and its load in danger. Um, and it's bad enough that if there's a little screw somewhere that might be sticking out of the gunnel, you might not want to lean over and just pick it up or fix it because doing that might, things, might make things worse. And the same kind of thing, if there's a big rainstorm um, and you know that your umbrella or that your uh, raincoat is in the front of the boat, um, trying to move forward and reach it might be just that final straw that actually uh, submerges the canoe rather than trying to get to shore. Now, what's important with this is that if the lake waters are very still, this canoe can float for a long, long time. And so oftentimes people don't recognize their frailty levels because they've actually been floating in a, a very, very uh, sort of benign environment. So that lake has had no waves, no headwinds. And as a result, uh, they think that they're doing much better than they are. The families think that they're doing much better than they are. But really, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And so when I look at things and people sort of say, okay, um, well, how do I know I'm frail? Well, one of the ways uh, to think about things is that uh, it tends to affect all systems, not equally, but all systems. And they're not 18 years old anymore. So when you're looking at your lungs, um, they're not gonna function like a, a useful person. Um, the kidney, uh, the liver might not function well. Your heart, your kidneys, uh, the muscles uh, uh, can get uh, weaker, uh, your brain, uh, you can develop some uh, dementia issues. And then finally, the, the skin is not as, um, as tough as when you're 18 years old. So, so what does that mean really? Well, if you're uh, uh, deemed to be frail, like that pale blue line, you can see that your probability of survival um, drops dramatically um, over time compared to somebody who is not frail. And so when you look at the probability of avoidance of institutional care or the probability of not surviving, frailty is a strong indicator of how well you'll recover from whatever health issue comes about. So for those of you who like math, um, frailty times a stressor equals a bad outcome most of the time, not always. Um, if we were widgets, um, and everything was completely predictable, um, then uh, that would be a lot easier. But because we're uh, humans and we're frail and it's not a direct line from A to B, um, it doesn't always end up in a bad outcome, but it often does. Okay, so I'll stop for questions for now. And I'm looking here and there are none in the chat. No, I don't see any yet either. Have Feel free to write them as we go along as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Robert has has asked that I I pause and and uh, ask the question during the presentation. Okay. Well, well, there is one comment here about uh, the fact that our system does not sustain frailty. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, that's uh, very true. I mean, um, I would even say that our system is bordering on the frail. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because when we have, uh, uh, we had a huge stressor uh, that we didn't do well with. Uh, but even during flu season, which are minor uh, stressors, but predictable, um, there are a lot of changes in how we do things uh, in order to cope with uh, a small uh, increase in hospitalizations. And there is a question here about at what point to advocate for a patient who is frail to start receiving palliative care in a long-term care home. Okay, um, so that's a really good question. Um, the, when it comes to long-term care, um, we know from uh, 2016 data that um, by the time you're, uh, you're actually admitted to long-term care, um, your frailty is such that you actually have uh, a 40% chance of dying in the first year 
of admission. Okay. Um, not only that, but uh, when you're admitted, your average length uh, of stay is is uh, close to two years. Now, average length of stay is a uh, code for average life expectancy. Okay, because you can only when your when your stay is over, that's because you've passed away, you died. And so, when you look at those statistics, um, they mimic um, survival rates of uh, uh, metastatic breast cancer. Uh, that were there, that were present about ten years ago. Okay, so if you are admitted to long term care, um, it is my opinion that um, you should uh, qualify for chronic palliative care, um, and that you should uh, seriously adopt uh, a palliative care approach. Now, everybody is different um, because I'm looking at frailty, and there are some people who require long term care. Um, simply because of one uh, issue. So for example, if you have cerebral palsy um, and you need uh, personal care that exceeds what's uh, available in the community, but you're able to still remain uh, quite uh, active um, and you're 40 years old or 50 years old, um, then you're, even though you've, you're admitted to long-term care, you don't fit the, the typical sort of population. Thank you. We have a number of other questions and comments in the chat. One uh, question was, could uh, the group get the link to the frailty classification slide? And I'm sure we could provide that in the yeah. follow-up. Yeah, is that the uh, clinical frailty scale? Um, if it's a clinical frailty scale, all you have to do is put that in your Google search um, and it will show up. Um, it's, uh, it's worldwide, um, and it's Canadian. And there's a question, um, about if somebody does not receive medical care and is frail, how long, uh, to, for survival? Um, and another question around, can you comment on the correlations between frailty with age, gender, and socioeconomic situations? Yeah, so I forgot the, the first questions already. Um, so <laughs> Sorry. Not, <laughs> so if no medical care, how long? No, so no medical care. So um, the uh, I guess the easiest way to answer that is um, it depends um, because if your canoe is overloaded um, and medical care, in my mind, being a doctor, simply means you know pills and examinations and looking at disease processes. But some people can be very frail um, and not have any kind of disease process that requires uh, sort of significant medical attention. But the, the way to look at this is more along the lines of if, you, if when you catch a cold, right, um, your level of function is here, you catch a cold and it takes you two or three weeks to get back to where you're at before, um, that's a sign that you're frail. And so it just means that if you get a, a bigger stress, you're less likely to do well and you're more likely to lose function. And as a result of that, that's when um, it becomes much more noticeable um, because now suddenly you require more medical attention. So as long as that lake water is still, right, uh, frailty becomes, it is unrecognized. Um, and there were two other questions. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a mix of, of questions and comments. So we'll go through the ones that are in the chat right now, and then we'll move uh, back to the presentation. So the one question was around, can you comment on the correlations between frailty with age, gender, and socioeconomic oh. status? Um, yeah, so uh, generally speaking, um, women survive things better. Okay, so uh, that's a general comment. Um, socioeconomic status, um, it, it, so frailty, while it's correlated to health, uh, to, to age, um, it, um, what, I, what I like about it is that it, it doesn't reflect age in any way. And so what happens is that if you've had um, a rough uh, time with health, with money, with food security, housing insecurity, and so on, we know that people end up with um, less resilience at an earlier age. So it's not that frailty is age related, um, but it's health related. And so if, you can't, if you have social determinants of health 
that have been very difficult, you're going to reach frailty, uh, a significant frailty level sooner uh, than somebody else with exactly the same genes, um, but a much easier upbringing. There's a comment here about how palliative care can be received in the community based on clients' wishes and capacity levels. Uh, request to show the slide with the classification again. Yeah, okay. Um, um, so we can go back to that maybe in a minute. Um, second. Uh, Paulette had a comment reflecting what you said earlier, Dr. Robera, that uh, should everyone in long-term care be allowed the use of a palliative approach? And I think you addressed that. Um, a question about what is the best thing to prevent frailty and kind of connected to that, can frailty be reversible? And if yes, how? So um, if you think of uh, frailty um, along the lines of uh, rust on a car, now, there, there comes a point where no matter what you do with your car, you can't undo the damage that the rust has done. Um, and that typically is because um, the, it's not just the rust itself, it's what's happened because the rust um, relieves some of the pressures. Um, so the doors don't close well, the hinges now start getting uh, sort of undone. So if you fix the rust and you sort of re put it back, you still have the hinges that now no longer work. So rust proofing works best early and over time is not as effective, um, but continues to be effective. Um, so what happens is that it's, I don't think you can reverse frailty, but I think you can uh, sort of get back some of the losses that you have so that the resulting frailty um, that will come, right? We're eventually we're all gonna have organs that are no longer 18 years old. You know, now when I go for a run, um, I do things very differently than when I was 18 years old um, because my body reminds me I'm not 18. Um, but so you can reverse things, but you, you can't bring it back to the way they were uh, like a, a long time ago. Um, and it will help with uh, reducing sort of future impacts, but it's limited. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not a done deal. Thank you. I think we'll move back through the presentation. There are a couple other questions that popped up, but I know we'll have time again to, to have some uh, questions. There is also one other comment about how I love the pictures that you've included in this presentation. The comparison with the constellations and the canoes are very representative, thank you. And I, I agree, I love the canoe imagery and, and being on a calm, calm water, you maybe won't notice things, but as soon as the gunnels get flooded. That's right, people who work with me are probably rolling their eyes because they've been hearing that for, <laughs> for over a decade. <laughs> So, so the question now is, um, when we're talking about um, uh, frailty and we're talking, you know, it's, it's a bad outcome and so on, and some people were intimating with respect to, well, why are we doing all this? And basically, because whenever we talk about prognosis, it's, it's always the question, when, right? When am I going to die? How long do I have? Uh, what do I expect next? Right? So today, for example, um, if you're a turkey in the United States, it's not a good day because um, it's American Thanksgiving. Um, but uh, if you've suffered this big sort of uh, challenge, then you probably have some time more to go. And so some of the uh, first things that we, um, we talk about for prognosis, how do you know that somebody um, is about to die or should uh, uh, sort of do better with a palliative care approach? The first thing is a surprise question, right? And so, you know, you're, you know, you're walking and all of a sudden you're faced with death. You know, why is that a surprise? Um, the, uh, so for, for those of you who don't know the surprise question, the surprise question is along the lines of, um, would you be surprised if this person were to die in the next six months, right? Not that I think they're going to die in the next six months, but if, if, six months from now, somebody passed away, would that catch you by surprise and go, oh, I didn't expect that? Or would you say, oh, you know, it's, 
adds to that, but it's, you know, I, I'm not surprised. Then um, there's a lot of things that uh, uh, people recognize, um, and it's a palliative performance scale, or PPS for short. And the important thing about this is that it is not a prognostic tool. Um, what it does is that it measures your function, so whether you can walk fully or you're mainly in bed, um, how much disease there is, um, how much self-care you can do if you're total care, um, how much you're eating and your level of consciousness. And the more of these you lose, the lower your PPS or your performance palliative, your, your palliative performance scale. What has happened though, is that in the cancer world, where there's a rapid decline that is uh, disease related, people have noticed that we can actually give um, a, re a relatively accurate uh, median survival in days. So once you have a PPS of 30, Median survival means that 50% of the people um, will, will die in, in a week, okay? Um, and so that's, that's important to recognize. Um, at the same time, it's important to recognize that in frailty, it does not apply at all, okay? Because if you remember those trajectories um, in, uh, in frailty, we don't have that steep curve that people in cancer have. Now, there's, uh, there's another one called the SPECT, um, so Supportive and Palliative Care Tool, and it looks at, at um, your activities of daily living, so ADLs. It looks at hospital admissions, um, and then disease-specific things. So there's your dependents, there's your hospital admissions. Um, and so you look at the nervous system with dementia or neurological diseases, you look at your heart, your respiratory, and then your kidneys and liver disease. Um, and if you have things, for example, with dementia, if you're, if you're starting to have eating and drinking, uh, you're eating and drinking less or you have swallowing difficulties, that's a sign that the dementia is progressing and that you're now becoming frail or you have, a pro, uh, you have a, an indicator of prognosis that is becoming much more clear. Um, locally, we have uh, being developed uh, what's called a RESPECT tool um, by uh, Dr. Amy Shu and Peter uh, Tennis Petro um, from uh, Bruyere. And basically, it takes the data that we already collect in people um, who are receiving uh, home and community care. Uh, the information that is required through the raw data um, is collected and has been tested um, such that uh, we now have a very good indication of what your prognosis is based on what your raw score is. Now, other things, you can have disease specific. Um, so uh, congestive heart failure with the Dugan model, uh, the child two, uh, the liver, and so on. Um, I won't go into those because, the, because they're disease specific and frailty tends to be disease non-specific. So I thought I'd start um, again with questions um, because that was a very quick overview on prognosis. Um, and I do appreciate with, with frailty, it's such a, um, it's an in-depth subject and uh, to try to do it justice in, in a couple hours, I either have to speak so fast that you don't hear what I say um, or just sort of just hit the, uh, the wave tops. Well, thanks for that overview so far. There was a question about what is the correlation of stages of frailty and prognosis or longevity? All right, so um, that was addressed uh, a while ago when you saw the, the, uh, the prognosis, prognosis curve with that pale blue line, um, so that the more frail you were, the less likely you were to survive. Um, and it's, again, it, it is very difficult because in big numbers, you can get uh, good statistics and good probabilities. But when it comes to smaller numbers, it really depends on um, again, you know, when you're floating on that lake, are you going to get the storm or not? That's what it boils down to. And there is a comment here about, um, Ruth is saying specifically in hospital, but the, the, uh, sometimes misconception that, um, palliative care, if you're receiving palliative care, you can't also receive medical care or, or quote unquote active care. Um, and, uh, the concern that because of that confusion, 
um, sometimes people don't get what's best for them and their family. Um, that's uh, very true. Uh, and this is where the definition of palliative care is um, so misunderstood. Um, a lot of people think of palliative care as you're actively dying, you've got days to live, right? And so if you're actively dying and you have days to live, I understand uh, some people sort of saying, well, why would, why would I fix a hip, right? Um, because, you know, at best, it's gonna, you're, you're still not gonna be out of the post-operative period before you're expected to die. What happens with a palliative care approach is that it is not actively dying. It's looking at things and making sure that what you're doing is actually improving or minimal improving quality of life or minimizing disability, right? And in some instances, addressing specific goals of care. Um, so um, as an example, um, you know, I was looking after somebody in the community who basically said, you know, um, I want to live at least till Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving. And I, so I said, why? And, she, and it, it, she said, because there's a James Bond movie I want to watch called A mm -hmm. Time to Die, and it comes out the Thursday before Thanksgiving. So I want to watch the movie and have time to reflect on how much I enjoyed it. Okay. And, and so the idea here is I'm still providing a palliative care approach, but if there's a pneumonia that I think she'll survive, why would I not treat it? Right. Um, and so... And so in, in the hospital setting, when they're de when people are dealing with, and, and I work at the Ottawa Hospital as well, so I, I experience that on a regular basis. You know, the, you know, somebody's, oh, you know, they're palliative in quotations. It's like, what? You know, they're surgical or they're psychiatric. Um, you know, these people have names and they, they've got sort of uh, personalities and, you know, they, they've got a whole bunch to, of uh, things to offer. Um, but you know, try to sort of look at, you know, end of life care. Yes, it's, it's part of palliative care. And that's the point. It's part of palliative care. Uh, you know, yeah, when I drive down to Toronto, you know, I, I don't talk about the drive down to Toronto as being, you know, the last uh, three miles when I get there, right? It's the whole journey. Thank you. Um, there is a comment that sometimes you're fading in and out a little bit. I think if you move away from your microphone. Yeah, I, um, I, yeah, I don't know where the microphone is. <laughs> okay. um, so, so if I can ask uh, that you just let the Nadine know, she'll remind me. Um, the, uh, again, <laughs> okay. was, I've been sitting all day, so I'm standing. And, uh, you know, people who know me know that I'm naturally fidgety. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I'm standing back and I'm just a little bit farther uh, from the microphone at that point. Thank you. If it's my uh, somebody fault. asked <laughs> if you could put the respect term up again. And that's another one. If you Google respect, um, yeah, actually, if you go big life, yeah, yeah. So if you Google respect or big life, um, yes. dot org, I believe, um, you'll, you'll have the tool. Um, it's, uh, it's being worked on right now to have it uh, available for the general public. Um, and uh, it's uh, being tested, uh, again, uh, a little bit of conflict of interest is being tested in one of the homes I work at um, to, uh, to see if it will help clinicians um, with respect to people coming into long-term care. There's a question here about whether or not long-term care refers to the University of Ottawa Heart Institute's cardiac supportive and palliative care program which is a specialized outpatient clinic for patients with, diagnosed with heart failure? So the short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is uh, people in long-term care have to pay for transportation. Um, and a lot of the uh, requirements for um, close follow-up um, are not possible in long-term care. Um, and so it's very nice. Um, it's uh, but I do have some people, you know, um, there's a few people who are frail, um, who have an ICD, uh, sort of like a defibrillator, um, implanted defibrillator, um, who go to the clinic, A, to get it tested, uh, make sure the battery's not low. Um, and at times just to get a sort of like a medication uh, uh, tune-up, uh, you know, some, some, sometimes even a, a short admission makes a big difference 
so that they can get a bit of fluid removed um, under observation. Um, in long-term care, uh, the access to diagnostics and the access to uh, laboratory services is very limited. Uh, some homes have it only once a week. Um, if you're a bigger home, uh, which is one of the ones I work at, we have it three times a week. But for some of the uh, things that need to be done, it's not enough. Allison had a comment that she's often thought that it is next to impossible to address frailty with your client when the determinants of health are not in place. Their central preoccupation rests elsewhere. Well, I would I have to agree with that, right? Uh, because, um, you know, 30 years ago, maybe even 40 years ago, Maslow sort of said uh, he had his hierarchy of needs or whatever. Um, and, you know, it's like, if, you're, if your bladder is full, right, um, right now, I know you're not listening to me, right? Because uh, it's a much higher priority need. Um, and so if you're going to be worrying about where your next meal is or where your next roof over your head is going to be, um, you know, that, that's far more important. So of course, frailty is going to fall second. Uh, that, no, that's absolutely true. And um, I don't see any other questions, just the comment uh, expressing appreciation for what you were talking about uh, for patients in the hospital, recognizing them as people first and foremost that uh, we should no longer be talking about when someone's deemed palliative. They're, they're a person with um, hopes and dreams and wishes and values, and that needs to be recognized. So like, appreciation expressed for that. Okay. All right, so let me just introduce this. Uh, so let's, uh, let's not just talk about a fictitious person, um, Mr. Norman Stage. Um, he's a 74-year-old 74 uh, man, widower. Um, his wife died about five or six years ago. He's got diabetes. He's had two MIs, so two heart attacks, um, and a, a, a procedure to open up his um, uh, arteries in his heart. Um, his, um, his heart does not beat regularly. Um, he was a longtime smoker um, and is now on home oxygen um, and has peripheral vascular disease, so poor circulation. Um, he's had a, a nice uh, rugged life um, and as a result has osteoarthritis. Uh, what's important is that he's had two hospitalizations, uh, one for pneumonia and one for a fall, and he also has a supportive family. And so this is what he looked like when he was 10 years younger. So the question I have, um, so what we, what we know as well is that uh, he used to play chess, but not, not so much anymore. Um, he enjoys hikes, um, but he's a fair weather hiker and hikes with his family. And when the family's not around, he'll walk around the block and he still lives in his home. Um, and uh, people notice that there's a bit of clutter. So the question I have is, um, how frail is he if we were to use the uh, clinical frailty scale? And should I run the poll question? Oh, yeah, that's a poll. That's a poll question. Okay. Should I, I'll run it here now then. Yeah. Okay, perfect, thanks. And uh, again, if, if you're on a device that's having trouble accessing this, just write your, your answer in the, in the chat for this, please. Okay, I'll give it about uh, 20 seconds or so. Right, everyone should be seeing the results yeah. there. Okay. Uh, so it looks like 32% uh, of people said vulnerable and 33% uh, said mildly frail, 29% said moderately frail, and 4% said severely frail, and 1% said they didn't know. Okay, all right. So big mix of answers. All right, so um, I'll leave it as that because uh, one of the nice things about frailty is, uh, you know, when you start a treatment, you really don't know what the outcome is. 
So I'll leave everybody hanging, okay, on purpose, um, but we'll get back to that. So now I'm gonna add in some uh, extra information, okay? Um, I did mention that uh, he has a supportive family. Um, and by that, what's meant is that uh, they do the banking, they do the groceries, and they uh, make sure that he gets to all his appointments. Um, when he was in the hospital, he was there for two weeks for a simple pneumonia um, and still is not at baseline for mobility and requires a walker, which he wasn't using. And that's what uh, happened with his fall. Um, for medications, he's got three medications for his heart, four for his diabetes, one for sleep, two for pain, and four multivitamins and supplements. So now the question is, um, how frail do you think he is now? If I can ask you to um, uh, sort of put it on the uh, frailty scale. And maybe uh, if you could just go to the next slide. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, just so people can see the scale again. Perfect, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll just give it another 15, 20 seconds or so again. I see a lot of the responses are coming in. Okay. So, we, so we're seeing a change in information. And uh, the reason I, I put that in <coughs> excuse me, is specifically because uh, one of the nice things about frailty is whatever is said by the person uh, needs to be corroborated by a third party. Uh, and so oftentimes frailty is unrecognized because the person thinks they're doing better um, and they'll mention, oh yeah, I still go hiking uh, without mentioning that, well, I only go when it's nice and only when I have family. Um, oh, no, 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 I do my banking, but the banking are not actually going to the bank um, and so on. So getting collateral information uh, with frailty is very important. And sometimes the spouse um, will offer information that is misleading. So they're, they're remembering um, the way uh, their spouse was, so they were able to hike. Oh no, he still goes hiking. Um, but when you ask and you dig down deeper, well, no, actually that was you know three years ago and so on. And so that was just, uh, I saw a big shift in how people um, uh, um, sort of changed their answers. And that's the idea behind getting additional information uh, with uh, frailty. It's called collateral information. So when people say something, you do need um, sort of, uh, how do they say in accounting, you know, um, you, you trust and you verify. So one of the big, one of the things about frailty um, is that unlike cancer, so as an example, if, um, you know, uh, somebody has cancer, the first thing they think about is when am I going to die? How long have I had, right? Um, and you're concerned about the prognosis when you're diagnosed. Um, and then you find out that, you know, the treatment calendar dominates the life, you know, you get many services, many providers and so on. Um, and that idea of survival um, continues. But in the context of frailty, um, so as an example, congestive failure, um, there's no actual real start, right? You, you, get a, you get a bit of congestive failure, you recover. Um, and so at that time, there's not a lot of prognosis that's being discussed. Now, some of that has to do with the advances we've done in medicine, uh, because I remember in my training, um, if somebody was admitted to a hospital uh, with congestive heart failure, um, their life expectancy was less than two years, right? Um, nowadays, it's, it, it's far greater than that. But because of that, um, the physicians and uh, the person has very little understanding at that time. You got congestive heart failure, but hey, I recovered, right? And, uh, but as things uh, progress, instead of thinking about survival and prognosis, it's more along the lines of, I hope it won't get worse. And then there's other things to cope with that comes along. And then as frailty uh, continues, 
your social world starts getting smaller. Um, and some, some people are frail to the extent where they actually have very few visitors. And so when, when you start talking about, you know, chronic disease exacerbations, you can see how there's a big drop um, and so on. And so at first you're returning back to baseline, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. But after a while, when frailty starts setting in, now all of a sudden you're not coming near baseline at all. And so I would argue that frailty becomes quite significant if you have a PPS of 30 at the time that you're unwell. Okay. Um, and that is, I think, a, a nice guideline. So PPS of 30 um, is essentially somebody who is bedridden um, because they don't have the strength to get out of bed. Um, they're still able to eat, um, but they have very little energy, um, but mobility is severely uh, limited. And so if that's the case, this is when uh, a palliative care approach should be considered. And so when we, when we look at frailty, um, the, the, thing, the thing is, is that you know, when, when you have um, no disability at all, and then you have a catastrophic something, this is where people in the hospital sort of look at our, our palliative care. If there's progressive disability like MS, it tends to be, uh, or Parkinson's disease, it tends to be much more predictable. But what happens is that when somebody is severely frail, they're at this level all the time. Um, and so you'd be wanting to start palliative care, uh, uh, an approach anyways, at this time, um, but in the hospital setting, they're seeing them at over at that time. So this is what people see in the hospital setting, and, and this is what we see with severe frailty or even um, uh, moderate frailty. Now with moderate frailty, it'll be a little bit lower, um, but the, the dips in, uh, well in this case, in this case, because we're dealing with disability, the spikes in disability would be going up uh, to that higher curve. And so uh, frailty, basically, um, if you think of it as a whole bunch of near misses, okay? Um, and so for, for people who deal with frailty, um, you, you can see things and you sort of go, geez, I don't think, I think this is it, right? And you ask family to come and visit, um, say their goodbyes, and next thing you know, the, the person perks up again, um, almost back to where they were. Um, and, you know, it, it, that is perhaps why some people think of frailty as, a, as an F word. What's important uh, though, is that unless somebody tells you you're frail and this is what's going on, right here in the gray zone, gray line, is where the person actually thinks that their health is. Whereas the clinician sees the health going down. And so because of these disabilities over here, because they're gradual, uh, the person doesn't actually realize, they still remember when they were up here, um, and they're not recognizing that this is no longer where they are. And so this mismatch um, is where a lot of people have trouble um, because the, the clinicians looking after things over here, uh, we're not aware of the frailty um, and its consequences. So how do we know someone's frail? So basically, um, I, I like the gold standards framework. Um, I also talked about the SPICT, um, um, but it, that's the reason why I talked about it very uh, minimally because I prefer this one. It's very easy to remember um, because it's called the Proactive Identification Guide. And now that you've seen this, uh, this uh, beautiful sow, um, I, I hope that you'll remember, and all you have to do is uh, uh, you know, look up gold standards and it's named after gold. It's not that it's the gold standard, it's named after a person um, and it's a proactive uh, identification guide. And so the thing about organ failure is that your decline is erratic, okay? I don't know if you remember, but that cancer decline sort of went well and then suddenly people would uh, start declining. Whereas with organ failure, it, it tends to be erratic. So when you're looking at respiratory failure, for example, in stage COPD, um, if somebody, uh, so poor prognostic indicators, so signs that you're not going to do well with the with a health insult um, include if you've been told that it's severe. 
Um, of course, if the surprise question applies, what's important is that if you qualify for home O2, right, that in itself is a bad prognostic sign. And then lastly, if you have symptoms such as lack of hunger or reduced activity in the context of cardiac and respiratory uh, failure, it basically means that when you're eating, the distribution of blood to the intestines for digestion is actually making you short of breath. Just that slight normal reflex that we take. So as a result, people will not eat as much because again, back to that Maslow uh, sort of hierarchy, you know, breathing is more important than eating if you have a choice. When we're looking at uh, heart failure or congestive heart failure, uh, New York uh, Heart Association stage three, which is um, you can walk to, uh, to the bathroom and back. Um, stage four is you can't walk to the bathroom and back uh, without feeling short of breath. If you have repeated uh, hospital admissions and particularly if the uh, time to get out of the hospital takes longer and longer. And then lastly, um, if you're uh, extremely well treated, but your ejection fraction is still under 30%, um, despite that, that's a poor prognostic sign. Uh, kidney failure, uh, stage four. So stage five is uh, dialysis. Um, and stage four is you're just about to have dialysis. Um, and important uh, about this to keep in mind is that when we look at uh, uh, kidney failure, uh, we're looking at uh, a number that's called uh, the creatinine. And the thing about creatinine um, is that you require muscle mass to generate enough creatinine. And so what happens is that as you become more disabled or more frail, uh, compared to somebody who's less frail, you actually have much less muscle mass. And so what happens is that you do not produce enough creatinine because you don't have the muscle mass. And so in essence, you don't, you're unable to generate enough of the materials that would say your kidneys are not doing well. And so one of the things to keep in mind is to not trust those values um, or to put a grain of salt in the context if somebody has very poor muscle strength, which is what we call sarcopenia. So back to that, you know, if you have a creatinine of 70 um, and um, then uh, what, what you, what you uh, will be doing is that you'll be told, uh, if you have a renal failure, you'll be told you low protein diet. Um, but if you have liver disease or low muscle mass, you might not be able to generate that, uh, that creatinine anyways. And so, and there are some medications that can improve uh, the secretion of uh, creatinine, but most of, for example, uh, an antibiotic, but most of these are not used um, or uh, other than uh, treatment of infections. So this is the normal muscle mass. Somebody with sarcopenia would have a smaller, much smaller amount. And we see that in a lot of older uh, people that they, they have very thin legs, very thin arms. Um, when you look at neurologic disease, so for example, uh, Parkinson's disease or even uh, dementia, ongoing decline uh, despite optimal th uh, therapy, and some of the symptoms, if they're based on reflexes uh, that are difficult to control. Um, and then if you start uh, getting uh, aspiration pneumonias, these are a sign that your swallowing reflex is no longer working well. And that's important because when babies are born, um, they're born with that swallowing reflex intact. So if through disease you are losing that swallowing reflex, um, it's a very primitive reflex and that's very, very important to recognize. Uh, liver failure, um, so, uh, you know, you, you can measure it through serum protein, serum albumin, um, and glycemic metabolism, so your blood sugar metabolism will be affected if you don't have a good liver. And that's why a lot of people, as they get frailer, their blood sugar control can improve, um, and they might require less uh, sort of diabetic medication. And then lastly, I'd like to sort of comment on skin. And then think of it as a dermal failure. Um, we, we know this is like 20 year old data, so it's not new. Um, but we know that if you have a pressure injury, um, then you are more likely to die, not because of the pressure injury, but because the pressure injury is a prognostic feature of how close you are to death. 
So it's important to treat, um, but it doesn't mean that um, it will affect survival. So if the pressure ulcer is bad enough, um, you may actually uh, end up dying with the ulcer, but the ulcer would not have caused the death. The ulcer was a predictor of the dying process. Um, and it's due to a variety of things, um, nerves and blood vessel, uh, blood vessel circulation issues. And then also we like to talk about uh, brain failure. Um, and so your brain is responsible for a whole bunch of things, right? From uh, regulating your breathing, to getting your heart, to uh, making sure your liver produces uh, sugar as it's supposed to, the intestines, and everything's uh, done through uh, the brain, coordination, that kind of stuff. And so when we're talking about the brain, if I can ask you to uh, just think about uh, Mr. Mencha, Oops, um, and so he's got a PPS of 30, um, which to remind people is somebody who's bedridden. Um, and so I'd like to have a, a poll just to see uh, what you think his prognosis is. Uh, weeks at most, maybe months, uh, months to many months, um, or I have no idea. All right, I'll just give it another 10, 15 seconds or so. Looks like uh, most people have answered. And uh, just for, for people viewing the recording, um, it looks like 35% of people said weeks at most, and 45% said maybe months, and 11% said many, many months, and 10% said they didn't know. Okay, so that's, uh, that's cool. And again, as with uh, frailty, I will not give the answer. Um, not that there is an answer. And if you're looking for a answer, um, all I have to say is it's 42. Okay, and for those of you who watched um, Galaxy's uh, uh, The Guide to the Galaxy, uh, we'll know what I'm talking about. So when we talk about uh, dementia, um, you know, we're told that we use a roughly 10% uh, of our brain. And when you think of dementia, I want you to think about uh, a system, a, an electronic system that is overwhelmed. So that at all times, in somebody with dementia, that brain is functioning at 100%. There is no reserve. Um, there's no capacity for, there's no surge capacity. There's no capacity for extra because it's functioning at 100%. And so I would sort of think about, well, you know, if you're hurt, we're functioning as best as it can and you were, you were unable to sort of do what it, uh, the heart is supposed to do, we would call it congestive heart failure. Um, if your lungs are doing that, we'd call that respiratory failure. And I'm trying to introduce the idea of, well, what about brain failure? And so when, when we look at delirium, I would like people to start now thinking in the context of frailty, that delirium is brain failure. Okay, so if you have hallucinations and you're withdrawn, you have an acute change in mental status, due to something physical, um, then think of that as brain failure in the context of uh, dementia. And so if you think about brain failure and your brain is working at 100% all the time, you can see how now all of a sudden, um, if it's not doing too well, how all the organs, the way they naturally coordinate with each other, how all the reflexes work together, that now this might, might be significantly impaired only because they have dementia. And so on the practical side, people have trouble planning, organizing. So think about taking medications, uh, think about eating on time, um, eating healthy, um, all those other things that we take for granted. So to answer your question, what happens with uh, dementia um, is that it is being looked after in the clinical frailty scale over here. And so basically your level of frailty in the context of dementia 
depends on your level of dementia. So for Mr. Uh, David Mencha, I have no idea when he's gonna die. Uh, with a PPS of 30, he probably has severe dementia. He probably cannot do uh, any personal care without help, okay? But I don't know, I need collateral information, okay? Um, so if that's the case, Severe dementia equals severe frailty. Okay, so severe frailty means I'm not surprised if he dies in six months, but I don't know if he will or not. So it's important when you look at the uh, clinical frailty scale to appreciate that dementia is now integrated into that. And so some of the common side effects uh, or complications of dementia um, medication effects, uh, sometimes the side effects become more important than the actual effect. So oftentimes medications that we use for dementia actually make people feel worse because they're not sleeping, give them stomach upsets, and the memory enhancement and that social uh, uh, ease that uh, it generates is no longer working. Um, aspiration pneumonia is that loss, that swallowing reflex. And then if you do get an infection, that ability for the body to sort of go together. Um, your mobility issues, coordination issues, uh, fractures of all kinds, falls. Um, and then finally, inanition, so they're just like the slow uh, dying process or cachexia, which is a, a lack of hunger. So when we talk about uh, this kind of stuff, um, you know, we, we want to, when, you, when you're, there's mild pro, uh, cognitive impairment, you're looking at screening and preventing. But once you have mild dementia, you're looking at, hey, maybe you should start thinking about a palliative care approach. And then once you have moderate to severe dementia, absolutely, because now we're trying to prevent complications of the dementia. And then once you're bed bound, non-verbal, you're looking at uh, end of life care. It's just that you don't know when it's gonna happen because you're severely frail that canoe only has one inch of uh, freeboard, but the water can be very still. But that's why a lot of people with uh, severe dementia, if they have a mild case of pneumonia, do not do well in the hospital setting at all. And they actually are dying from the dementia, not from the cause, say a pneumonia, right? The dementia is, is really the cause of that collapse. So over time, as more and more waves come about, you can see how the person's health gradually becomes more and more precarious and how you lose more and more features um, so that from the outside, people can't recognize who the inside person was. Questions? So we have a few. Um, I'll go back to one of the earlier ones, and that is, is it possible for frailty to occur in younger pediatric populations? And if so, how does a palliative approach to care change? <laughs> That's an excellent question. The short answer is yes. <clears throat> I used to do palliative care. I used to be on that regional palliative care team for CHEO. Um, and yes, there is frailty. Um, there's multi-organ, uh, multi-system uh, conditions. Uh, there's progressive neurological conditions as well, uh, which mimic um, uh, the, the dying process from Parkinson's disease or from dementia, um, but it's in younger people. And so the, the palliative care approach is very, very uh, much more difficult um, in the context that when someone's lived 60, 70 years, um, families have a much easier time understanding the dying process and um, being able to rationalize it, um, but with a child, it's much more difficult. Um, but the, the essence, the treatment approaches are virtually the same because the body functions in a similar fashion. Uh, the drug doses are different. Um, the drug metabolism is different. Um, so some drugs you need higher doses and other drugs you need lower doses. Now the approach for symptom control is similar. The approach for reducing complications to uh, things that are likely to happen is similar. So if somebody has um, um, SMA, so which is the, the child's equivalent of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, we can see where after a while, um, you know, there, there's not, uh, there's a lot less um, 
awareness of the environment simply because the breathing is not working well enough. But it's a similar approach. Thank you. Um, a question about COVID and isolation and the restrictions, uh, are they large risk factors that could increase frailty? The, um, so when, uh, what, I, what I didn't, because I'm skipping over all the, uh, as much as I can, um, another way to describe frailty, and I had to cut stuff out, but another way to describe frailty um, it is that imagine a, a step stool <clears throat> with four legs, one of which is your mind, the other one is mobility, um, another one is uh, your social life, right? Um, and then the last one is everything that's happened to you before. Okay. Um, and so what happens is that you, that, that stool is it, it's nice as long as everything's equal. Um, and what happened with COVID is you cut out the social leg, and then everything got tilted. Um, and, and a lot of people did not do well at all. Um, and so, yeah, the social side of things in the context of frailty um, is very, very important in slowing it down. And I think this is, this is somewhat connected, but where does depression come in and affect outcomes? Oh, that, that is a very loaded question. Um, because frailty is associated with aging, um, um, it's very difficult in older people uh, because depression does not show up the same way, right? The, the mood uh, tends not to be as, um, as prominent. Um, so people, if they're depressed, will tend to do less, will tend to isolate, but may not necessarily feel sad um, as a younger person would, may not necessarily feel hopeless like a, a younger person would. Um, and it's bad enough that um, at, at times it actually mimics dementia. Um, and so um, frailty, uh, one of the things that you can do and which does help a lot is just maintain that social uh, side of things um, because you wanna make sure that people don't start becoming depressed because of loneliness, right? Which is completely treatable um, as opposed to um, sort of uh, depressed because of something else going on, which is much more difficult to, to treat. So that's, that, it's, it's, that's as good as I can answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And the last question that's there is, are MCI factored into the frailty scale? Um, yes, um, when, you, when you look at it, um, the, the, the main, so MCI is a, a minimal cognitive impairment. Um, so for, for people who um, uh, have trouble with a bit of remembering and stuff like that, but they don't necessarily, necessarily have a loss of function, okay? So you can have a diagnosis of MCI. In the past, it was called dementia, um, but it's since been sort of much more tailored. So you can have people um, with minimal supports, um, just having somebody check in, um, do quite well alone with um, MCI. Uh, the important thing is just to make sure that, um, you know, all the rest of the stuff that, that sort of keeps all the other organs going well uh, are maintained. Um, so if you think of that, um, because of the level of uh, dementia, I'll call it dementia, um, is uh, low, it will reflect low as well on the frailty scale, right? So another way to put it is the, the more dementia you have, the frailer you are, the less dementia you have. So if you have MCI, the less frail you are. Um, so with MCI, um, I would argue that the level of frailty would probably be more, uh, would be a truer measure of what other uh, sort of uh, functional loss you had for other stuff. And if you had very little functional loss, then you'd probably be sort of at risk or mildly frail. Thank you. That's all the questions we had for the moment, but we'll also have a little time at the end. So if anybody has some more, we can, um, and I noticed a couple participants raised hands. So if you have a question, if you could just add it in the chat. And if it's a technical issue, um, then you can also add that there. 
Yeah, uh, when there's a lack of questions, I worry about my third objective, which is for people to stay awake. <laughs> well, there's an, one more question that just came in. Is your definition of, oh, I'm going to say this wrong, cat, cat, cataxia? <laughs> okay. Really just lack of hunger. Um, actually, um, wait, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you're probably one of those people that can give the talk. Um, so, so when you, when you look at the, the, the giants of geriatrics and we're looking at uh, chronic palliative care, really the focus is on what matters most. So goals of care, right? And so when you talk about goals of care, um, people did look at things and, there, um, and basically there's a whole bunch of different goals of care, right? I alluded to cure of disease with my lady, should she have had a pneumonia before her movie came out, would have want that pneumonia cured, right? But uh, I'll be talking about optimizing quality of life, maintenance of control, good death, and support for families, uh, primarily, uh, keeping in mind that all of these are, are important. Um, it's just that when we talk about goals of care, it's not simply um, uh, sort of one or two things to, to think about. And so when, when we look at goals of care, this is uh, from the Mayo Clinic. Um, where they're looking at uh, end-stage congestive heart failures, and only 12% of the doctors in this uh, clinic, in, uh, in this um, clinical setting for decompensated congestive heart failure, only 12% of the physicians felt comfortable talking about uh, goals of care or even advanced care planning. Now, this was measured uh, three months later when they found less than half of the patients going through that clinic um, had any kind of uh, goals of care or discussions, even though their level of uh, congestive failure was very significant. So basically, it, it says that people are not comfortable talking about goals of care. Um, and so I'll promote um, this serious illness conversation guide um, in the context, oops, in the context of how do you approach things. And so this, is, this was developed by um, Ariadne Labs um, and is uh, uh, becoming much more widespread in the hospitals. I know the Ottawa Hospital has a specific program for this, but basically it, it looks at uh, patient tested language uh, to have people understand where they're at uh, very quickly. And it talks about uh, language. So language such as I wish, right? I could do something um, to, um, you know, uh, I wish the situation were different. Um, I wonder if you thought about this. Um, what are your biggest fears? Um, if you become sicker, how much are you how much are you willing to go through for the possibility of getting more time? And so, with this, you can get down to uh, goals of care and finding out what's really important for people um, much more quickly because this language has been tested and refined. Now, one of the things that everybody is worried about is, well, you know, what if I get it wrong? And all I can say is we will get it wrong, right? But just like when I trip and stumble, right? Um, I don't stay down, I just get up and, you know, sort of learn from that. But some of the pitfalls are, you know, talking about goals of care too late. So now what's important is no longer possible. Uh, some, for some people starting too early, um, makes them fearful of what's coming or can even generate anger. Um, and that this here, expecting too much too soon. Um, so you have to remember that when you're talking about advanced care planning and goals of care, it's really a journey, it's a process, um, it's a discussion, sometimes a negotiation. Um, so never try to do it all in one setting um, because if, if you have that as a goal, um, you're likely to get frustrated. The patient or that the person in front of you um, is likely to get frustrated as well. And, and of course, watch the bias in your conversation. So what does prognosis really mean? Well, it depends. Survival, maintenance of survival, maintenance of function, or control of symptoms. And so this is really important um, because once people start understanding what's really important for them, um, we know that they make very different decisions. So I, I and they heard conflict of interest. Um, I work at the Pearly um, and we had this um, uh, 
uh, goals of care discussion that we called CME. Um, and we applied it to everybody who came in. And before we did um, the, uh, the CME program, um, we had about 26% uh, of people wanting to be transferred to hospital. And within a year of instituting the program, the number of people willing to be or wanting to be transferred to hospital was halved. And the only difference, uh, the clinicians did not change, the staff did not change. The only difference was we're looking with a frailty lens and people began to understand that if you go to a hospital, you, you will be treated, but you will lose a lot of function simply because of your uh, frailty level. So being a physician, right, um, you know, I, I'm looking at goals of care and we're talking about what matters most. Um, but keep in mind that mind and mobility are very important, um, as are medications, right? And so when, when you look at, uh, back to uh, Mr. Sage, right, when I'm looking at his medications for his heart, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, what am I doing? How long is that benefit expected to last? Um, how long will it take before it lasts? Um, what, what side effects might come from that? And so should I go for short acting or long acting? And if he's severely frail and his uh, prognosis is estimated to be uh, a year or two, are there benefits for medications that have been shown to provide uh, protective effects five to 10 years later? Another way to put that is, you know, it, do I start rust proofing my car when it's 15 years old and expect a good outcome uh, compared to rust proofing it when it's brand new and expecting a good outcome. When I look at his lung issues, again, same kind of thing, uh, but it's important to realize that if he's got puffers and he can't suck them back, right? Um, now you have to start looking at maybe uh, instead of inhalers to use a spacer, um, maybe to look at um, long acting medications uh, so that he doesn't have all these puffs to take, or on the contrary, short acting. Um, and then symptom control. So with uh, COPD um, or respiratory symptoms, we can really use uh, opioids to help with that feeling of shortness of breath. Um, and so when to start? And you know, a lot of people worry, well, if you're starting me on morphine, it must be that I'm dying um, imminently, when in fact, that's not necessarily the case. Actually, it's usually not the case. Um, when I'm looking at uh, his diabetes, right, um, he's at a stage now where if I have tight blood sugar control, it'll help him 10, 15 years from now, um, but he's not likely to live the 10 or 15 years. At the same time, if he has a low blood sugar, he's likely to fall, fracture something, and that's more likely to kill him sooner than the good sugar control or even a high blood sugar um, will. Uh, in the future. So in this case, if we're looking at longevity, ironically, um, or paradoxically, having a higher blood sugar target actually helps longevity because we're removing the high risk situations. And this goes for blood pressure as well in people who are uh, 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 very frail. Looking at insulin, um, should we go, if somebody has an erratic eating pattern, uh, should we go with short acting insulins uh, so that we can sort of go with the flow or worry about low blood sugars uh, with the longer acting uh, insulins and on the days where he doesn't eat much worry about low sugars and falls and so on. So there are tools uh, there to assist the risks of medications. So beers criteria, I'm just, these are uh, more for the physicians, uh, beers criteria, uh, a screening tool on when to, um, uh, stop medication, a uh, screening tool to when to start uh, medication, but aiming for medication that's low risk. <clears throat> looking at side effect profile, um, looking at which medications um, uh, offer less effect over long periods of time. And of course, in the context of prescribing, making sure that you're prescribing things with time limits um, so that, you know, we'll, we'll treat this for three months or for two weeks or so on. Because if you don't, you can end up what's called a, a prescribing cascade. So this is a made up example, but let's say somebody 
um, as high blood pressure, you want to treat it um, and you use a calcium channel blocker. These are medications that are known to cause leg swelling. So then we give them a diuretic, right? Uh, uh, so a water pill, um, but the water pill uh, makes the potassium levels go down low and cause constipation. At the same time, this uh, class of medication can cause reflux. So there's that little symptoms of reflux and then we give a medication to reduce the reflux, um, which ends up uh, somebody being B12 deficient. And then calcium channel blockers cause constipation. And so now we have to add in a laxative as well. Um, so you can see how by picking medications correctly, especially in the case where um, if his blood pressure is low, he might actually be in a worse situation and we're causing all these other uh, predictable uh, cascades. <clears throat> Um, now, uh, at the same time, um, you know, it's, uh, it's important to, to ask, you know, is there an underlying dementia, right? Um, how's the family coping? Do we have advanced care planning, you know, the legal, financial, and so on? Now, why would I think that there is a dementia? Well, we sort of heard things, um, and so we do a lot of dementia care, but there are hints. You know, he's walking less. His social circle is getting smaller. He actually requires help with um, most of those independent activities of daily living. Someone's doing the banking and the groceries. Uh, people are coming in, very supportive family. Um, and uh, he's also now not recognizing or maybe having an inability uh, to plan to get it, to keep his house clean, which is where you notice the, um, the clutter. <clears throat> now here's... Um, <clears throat> Here's that uh, cachexia question. Um, so the important thing about uh, cachexia is that we'll see it in all stages of chronic dying, uh, the chronic dying process. We see it often as well, um, but usually in the last uh, weeks in the cancer world. And the easiest way to describe, so you can see here 30% or more people um, will have cachexia when they're uh, dying of chronic uh, COPD, congestive heart failure, kidney disease, arthritis, chronic liver disease. Look at these numbers, right? We're looking at 30% on average, but with renal disease, it, it goes up even to like two thirds of the people. And so again, for people who don't understand cachexia, or if you, um, if this is the first time you're hearing it, cachexia is not starvation, okay? That's the key feature. I mean, if you play Scrabble, uh, cachexia is 22 points. So if I'm not feeling well, um, oh, actually imagine that uh, you're at Thanksgiving dinner um, and the host um, is there and you've had tons to eat, right? Um, and now your host insists that you have another serving. And so when you eat that extra serving, it no longer tastes as good. It doesn't go down well and you feel worse having eaten that little extra. So in the dying process with cachexia, uh, people will feel that way after a few bites. They don't have to have a full meal. The second component of cachexia has to do with a diet texture preference. So if I'm not feeling well and I go down to the family dinner um, and there's steak or chicken to chew on, I might not want to eat it. Uh, but if there's shepherd's pie, I might poke around with the ground beef or maybe the mashed potatoes. But if I'm still really not hungry, maybe I'll just have a little bit of the pudding. And if I'm really not hungry, I'll just have chicken broth. And that, um, that progression from a regular diet, minced, pureed, thickened fluids, and then finally fluids, is the second component of cachexia. And once you start going down, you, have an, you are dying, but not imminently. And so with cachexia, you see that all the time. It's important to recognize um, because it's a sign that the body is no longer able to cope with normal nutritional expectations. So again, with starvation, the body is trying to survive. So as a result, people suffer because they're not eating. With cachexia, the body is dying, so people suffer when they are eating. So when we look at, uh, uh, at what's going on in, in the context of where your life is going and, you know, um, there are ways to use the PPS, um, but keep in mind that um, essentially your muscles 
will start becoming um, affected. So through the sarcopenia, right? Your brain through early dementia, maybe, um, so that your, your social world is getting smaller. Your physical world is getting smaller. Then as things continue to progress, thinking becomes more difficult. So you'll see people, they'll take longer to, uh, to answer questions. They'll take longer to understand things. They may not be able to sort of go through the whole news or finish their crossword puzzles as they once were. And then eventually you start going into the cachexia component uh, where the kidneys and then yeah, this is end of life stuff. Um, I love this. Again, it's colorful. It's from Dr. Coulomb, who's a, a pioneer locally um, in home palliative care. So the contractions that you see um, are social. Uh, geographic, okay, so fewer people, but a smaller location. Um, uh, activities of daily living that are independence, so not personal hygiene, but going to the bank or to the grocery store, uh, doing your cooking. Eventually your ADL, so self-grooming, bathing, going to the bathroom. Uh, eventually cachexia, and then lastly, end of life. So take home. Please appreciate that with frailty. It's a slow dying process. Um, so you need to appreciate that the prognosis is unpredictable. Um, the best you can do is predict when that next wave is gonna come. And that's important for the care staff, families and patients. Um, training is super important, okay? So it, most of the people who are frail um, live, are, are living at home. But keep in mind that once you start losing those IADLs, that ability to do the things for yourself, those who have better means end up in retirement homes. So I would argue that anybody who qualifies for a retirement home or goes to a retirement home is automatically already entering into the moderately frail group. So do get trained though. There's palliative care training. Um, if you're doing long-term care, there's uh, a pallium and there's, a, there's my conflict of interest with respect to a facilitator. Uh, frailty education like we have right now um, and then appreciation of the dying process in the home setting. So, you know, if, if you're aware of what's going on, you're now part of the solution. And so finally, the, the thing to uh, keep in mind is I did mention that um, this is where people think they are. And this is where we, uh, as uh, clinicians, uh, feel that their disease process is. But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize um, is that the blue line is there a spiritual distress, okay? And the green line mimics their psychological distress. And this is what we've seen um, back, you know, like over a decade ago um, in people who were uh, suffering with uh, end of life congestive heart failure. So they had a lot of unrecognized uh, spiritual and psychological distress. So this is one of the important features of frailty is that, um, at those high levels of functioning, people are still suffering. Um, it's just that it's not medicine-based um, and it's not outcome-based. So the key points, uh, timely identification, uh, understand frailty, remember the gold standards framework, that nice pig, um, trajectories of goal can be unpredictable and the goals of care are not medical most of the time. Uh, so this is the gold standard uh, uh, framework um, with the general indicators, the disease specific indicators, including dementia. Um, this is available online. So one of the things to keep in mind is barring any kind of uh, health challenge, if you see changes occurring from one month to the next, uh, expect months to many months, assuming the trajectory continues. If the changes are occurring week to week, we're looking at weeks and day-to-day -day days. Um, and this is more the act of dying or the end of life situation. And that's my talk. Thank you. We do have a number of other questions and comments in the chat. Okay. So um, when faced with acute delirium in a very frail client, how do you decide with the substitute decision maker about end of life orders versus trying to, in quotes, reverse the delirium? Okay. 
So it depends on the setting, because uh, that's a really good question. Um, reversing the delirium implies that there is a cause that is reversible. Okay. So in order to find that cause, you need to have rapid access to testing um, and ra rapid access to therapies that, if you have the cause, are likely to um, actually, I'll say, fix the problem so that the person has a strong likelihood of coming back close to baseline. Okay, um, and it's close to baseline. It's almost never baseline. So, um, you know, it. So for delirium, it's it's tougher because um, a lot of the causes are not brain related, right? Like when you have congestive heart failure and there's an acute congestive heart failure, people know how to treat that. Uh, but when there's brain failure or a delirium, it's it's caused because the brain is not is being used at 100 um, percent, and it's now it's stressed. And so the uh, so it's it's not firing the way it should. The body's response to illness, the body's response to treatments will not be the same. And so the higher the mobility uh, the person has, or the lower the frailty level uh, people are at, the more likely they are to survive that delirium. Um, but if you're um, a frailty level seven, which is completely dependent for all ADLs. Um, the chances of you surviving that well are low, um, but they're not zero. So then you go on to goals of care, right? If I'm going to treat this, uh, there's a chance that by treating it, um, when I use medications for the delirium, it's likely to render the person less uh, aware, which means less hunger, more dehydrated, and so on. Um, and if everything is treated correctly, um, the recovery will be partial to where they were before. Um, and so there's no right or wrong answer. It's, it, it's always to what end, right? Um, so if the end is because, because the grandchildren are coming over for Thanksgiving this weekend and they want to see grandpa, that's a valid, re like in my mind, that's a valid reason, right? Um, but if, um, if it's, I don't know why, there's something there, just fix it. Um, you know, the it might be a goal of care, but to me that indicates more that the family and the support systems around the person, um, are, if they are understanding what's going on, then, then great. But to me, it's usually they don't understand what's going on. But, but you know, there are some people who will have a tremendous amount of guilt if they feel that we didn't do everything, okay? And, and for me, the dying process um, is as much of the family um, as it is the person and the care team, right? And so uh, a good death is when all three are happy, right? Um, a not so good death is when one of us is unhappy and a really bad death is when we're all unhappy. <laughs> Caroline was asking, um, feeling that every client should have a goals of care conversation and how do you recognize if it's too early? The, uh, so the easiest way with recognizing it's too early is when you get pushback, right? Um, and so it's it's one of those things where um, you know uh, it, it and it's usually reflective of the person has 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 not understood where they're at, right? And so and so in, in long term care, as an example, when people come into long term care, uh, I by definition, right, they're, they're very severely frail, right, they're level seven on average, right, which means some people are even, <laughs> like they're eights, right, they're imminently dying, but no one's ever told them, right, um, and so when you, when you tell somebody, look, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you were to die in six months, um, of course, I don't say it that way, um, but the, uh, the idea here is that if they're completely surprised, right, um, just, just make sure that they do understand what's, what's going on. Um, and, and so when you get the pushback um, or when you sort of uh, get that really surprised look, like, what are you talking about? Um, that's usually a sign that it's too early or maybe it was too fast. Thank you. So there's a couple of questions around eating or not eating. So not eating is also change in taste buds and not having interest in food, where does this fall into? Okay, um, that's, that's, really, that's really tough. Um, oops, what happened here? 
Oh, okay. Uh, so that's really tough um, because um, the, there is a natural, uh, you know, just with, uh, with everything, the nerve endings after a while, they don't work as well. And, and taste is part of that. Um, and taste is a combination of smell and taste. So, so what happens is that um, if enjoying food um, has disappeared, um, this is where a lot of people um, will probably, if, if they're not eventually uh, sort of, if they're not cachectic, will probably just go down to sort of supplements um, that have very strong flavors in order to get some kind of flavor. Um, but it, you know, if chewing brings no joy, um, you know, if it, it's tough, um, at the same time, you know, if they're hungry, um, I would think that they would, they would eat, even though they're not getting joy. And Dr. Bimji was wondering, what is the pathophysiology of <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> dementia frailty. Thank you for that question. Um, so I don't know. Um, the um, and I use cachexia um, because it's the closest term I could find to relate what I've noticed and what others have noticed. Uh, my my suspicion is that um, as part of the dying process, uh, systems are starting to fail. And so while it's different than in the uh, cancer world where there's a lot of infla infla inflammatory uh, processes going on, um, in the chronic dying phase, I think that as systems start failing, um, the ability to function at 100% gradually drops. Um, and so if you overfeed, people feel uncomfortable. And so they naturally will not overfeed to avoid the discomfort. Um, and that's, that's why I'm using sort of like that, the big Thanksgiving meal. Um, and when I'm not feeling well, that's why I'm using that change in texture uh, preferences. Um, simply be, just simply to illustrate um, sort, of, sort of how the thinking process goes about. So the less you're feeling well overall, um, or the less your system is, uh, the farther your system is from 100%, um, the less likely you are to uh, take foods that are difficult to digest more difficult to digest. So I, sorry, Dr. Bimji, it's a, it's a non-answer, but. <laughs> what kind of palliative care could be provided and by who in a retirement residence if someone is presenting with vulnerable to mild frailty? So, so um, basically it's chronic palliative care, right? Um, because they, they still have a fair amount of independence. They're still able to People in a retirement home would be frailty level six-ish, okay? Um, although in some of the uh, retirement homes now with the additional uh, uh, unit set and, and staffing that they have, you, you, you can have palliative, acute palliative care um, or actively dying palliative care in the retirement home. Um, so, but the, the issue here is more along the lines of um, they, their, life, their prognosis is lower because by going into a retirement home, they are maybe unknowingly admitting that um, their activities of, uh, uh, their uh, independent activities of daily living, their IADLs are now more difficult. So somebody is gonna have to look after the cooking. Somebody has to look after the dishes. Somebody has to look after the groceries. Now I can still look after the banking, but there's, there's less uh, available. And, uh, often, and, and nowadays it's even harder because the families can actually look after the banking remotely, right? Like from, no, they, they can do that from across the world. So we did have uh, also in the chat a bit of a kind of a back and forth around goals of care conversations. The question came up around why is it different in Ontario than in BC and Alberta, for example. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to you to talk about goals of care, uh, but I just did want to mention um, yes, every province has a different um, advanced care planning, healthcare consent framework. Um, some people really, really love the Ontario framework and some people really, really do not. 
that doesn't change the mechanics and the need for a goals of care conversation. Um, so I think that's the important piece to, to focus on in this. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts around goals of care, advanced care planning, and, and how to best manage that given the Ontario context. Oh, um, just because I think in images, right? Um, if, you, if you think of goals of care along the lines of how am I going to plan my vacation in a different country? Okay. So yeah, I want to go to the museums. I want to go to the, uh, uh, the parks. I want to sort of have all the mm -hmm. restaurants. And so I tell the guide, I say, this is what's important for me. And the guide will sort of take me. And um, if he knows that it's going to rain, he's going to say, let's go to the museums instead of going to the parks. Okay. Now, I might have exactly that same idea um, in a different country. Um, but the approach is very similar, even though the language is different, the, the, even the side of the road that they drive on might be different, um, and the culture is completely different. The, the goals of care are what's important, and the legislation is just how do you get there, not what's important. Um, and so I think the legislation um, makes it easier or makes it more difficult to get to what it is that, that is important, so the goals of care. Um, but doesn't change the discussion and the meat behind the discussion. So if, um, as an example, you know, um, if, you, if you're on hemodialysis and you want to go to BC, it, one of your goals of care is, I want to go to BC. Well, you have to recognize that you'll need hemodialysis over there. So that has to be arranged because, and, and whatever rules for hemodialysis they have in BC, you'll have to follow. Right, And so if I were to take that and sort of say, okay, well, if you go to Europe, uh, where in some countries hemodialysis is twice a week, not three times a week, that's the rule, right? So the goals of care are still, I want to go there, but that's, those are the limitations I have based on the geography, not based on what's important for me. I don't know if that... It, <laughs> I think so. I, I think we could easily spend a whole uh, session talking about advanced care planning, goals of care, and, and what the different frameworks look like across the country. Um, I am trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. I'm sorry, I might have. I'm just scrolling through. Um, no sign of dementia, but very frail. What is life expectancy is one of the questions. Um, so this, uh, so again, your canoe is very overloaded. There's only this much freeboard. When is it going to sink? Right? Um, I don't know. Right? But I do know that if there's any kind of health challenge, right, that's probably going to be the last straw. Right? So, um, and that, that is why frailty um, is an F word, right? Because it's not as predictable as cancer uh, when people start declining from cancer. Um, you can see the decline, you have a really good idea. You, you can probably even um, have a fair chance of planning correctly your call coverage um, because of the way things, things are going. Um, because that PPS scale um, in the context of cancer um, is relatively, I mean, it's not accurate, but it's relatively much more accurate um, than in the, in, the, in the frail population. So I don't know. Um, it really depends on when the next uh, uh, health issue occurs. The, most of the other things I'm seeing in the chat are uh, thank you for the excellent presentation, especially your analogies and helping us or assisting our understanding of frailty. I think I scrolled through and saw a rock on Dr. Robert. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, I, I love all your images throughout and uh, all your analogies as well. I, I'm so, really you cool. know, you're, 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 really, you're really kind to me because it's been a hectic two weeks. And so poor Carl has probably been worrying, am I going to get this guy speaking after all or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, so thank you so much. I do appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
<laughs> I like that that comment. Someone said, "Rock on, uh, Dr. Wilbur." <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I'm going to uh, just, uh, as a reminder, again, I'm just going to put the post-session evaluation in the chat there. Yeah. Uh, so you'll see the link to uh, SurveyMonkey. If you don't have the time to, uh, to complete the survey tonight, don't worry. I'll, I'll email it out to everyone. And, and you don't have to, you'll only have to complete the survey once. So if you see it again when I, when I email it out, you can just ignore it if you, if you complete it today. And uh, I'll, I'll send out the slide deck too, in case uh, you want to go back and have a look. And I'll send out the recording as well. Yeah, and if, and if people have questions or whatever, I just put in my my email at the in the chat. It's a right. simple at bureaubearpreliehealth.ca. And yeah, absolutely. And someone in the chat asked if they can share it with their their colleagues. And please. Feel yeah, free to do that with the yeah, the, yeah. as long as um, credit is is given, right? So uh, credit for Ken Rockwood, credit for um, uh, Louise uh, Coulomb, um, and credit to all all those other people because I'm just put, I'm just bringing it together, right? Uh, <laughs> so as long as credit is given, where it's due. Absolutely. And uh, we have another comment come in that I really like. Someone says, I appreciate everything. Thanks a lot for the perfect presentation. <laughs> so there you go. It doesn't get higher praise than perfect presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. And thanks, Nadine. For, uh, yeah, thank, yeah, thank you for uh, steering me those questions and making me look good. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone else. Bye, have a good evening. Yeah, have a good evening.